I am Monica Payne, an ORISE fellow appointed to CDC's Center for Preparedness and Response, Division of Emergency Operations. Thank you for joining us, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Crisis and Emergency Risk Communication webinar titled Communication Channels. Today, we will hear from CDC's Kelly Waters, a Senior Health Communication Specialist. If you do not wish for your participation to be recorded, please exit at this time. You can also earn continuing education by completing this webinar. Please follow the instructions linked in your invitation you received. The course access code is CERC1024, with all letters capitalized. To repeat, the course access code to receive continuing education is, in all caps, CERC1024. Today's webinar is interactive. To make a comment, click the chat button on your screen and then enter your thoughts. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button. The Q&A session will begin after Kelly has presented. At this time, we will now transition to our presenter, Kelly Waters. Kelly currently supports the Emergency Risk Communication Branch, which oversees the CERC program. Kelly has over 15 years experience in public health communication. She has provided communication support during emergency responses to H1N1, Ebola, Zika, the 2017 hurricane season, and others. Previously, she has served as an editor, media liaison, and public information officer to internal and external partners, including congressional correspondents. She currently leads the CERC program and has conducted numerous national and international trainings on, sub on the subject matter. Thanks everyone for joining us. Kelly, please begin. Thank you, Monica. And hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. As Monica said, we are doing our program today on CERC's communication channels. This is our last webinar in this series. If you would like to access our previous webinars, they will all be posted on our website shortly and you'll be able to see all of them. But we are gonna do a brief overview of uh, the previous webinars just so you'll have a basis for understanding today's communications channels webinar. For those of you who have participated in the previous webinars, um, please bear with us for just this few, first few minutes so that we can go over the initial, um, the initial basics of CERC so that you'll have a foundation. And for those of you who, who weren't with us for the first few webinars, hopefully you will um, have enough from these first few minutes to, to have context to understand communication channels. So the purpose of CERC, crisis and emergency risk communication is really to help people make the best decisions in a bad situation. Um, you're gonna have really challenging time constraints and, and not the best choices when an emergency happens. But as professionals in emergency response, as professionals in communications, CERC helps us to help communities affected by emergencies make the best decisions that they can with those challenges. The right message, what we say at the right time, when we say it from the right person, who says it, who delivers that message, can save lives. So a little bit about crisis and emergency risk communication. This curriculum was initially developed in 2002, and it was developed as a curriculum. Now, um, after several revisions over, this, over several years, it's become more of a usable framework, something that we hope people can access um, and, and reference quickly in an emergency. The, the first draft of this document was developed prior to these six principles being developed, but after it was written, it was, it was noticed that really by and large, the curriculum itself could be, could be summed up in six easily recognizable and easily memorable six principles. Be first. Be first doesn't mean that you have to be the ver very first person to say something. Be first means that you should be the first organization to speak when it's when it's your responsibility to speak. So for example, for CDC, 
when there's a public health component to an emergency, it's our responsibility to share information when we have it, when it's available. It's our responsibility to be prepared to be present and accountable. Be right doesn't mean that we have all the answers. It means that we should be right and accurate with the information that we have. We don't want to speculate. But it also means saying what we don't know. And what we're doing, the process, what we're doing to fill in those gaps in information. And that right there is communication. Telling people what we know, what we don't know, and what we're doing to fill in the gaps are three different messages. That's how communication works. It's not having all the answers all at once. It's having information and sharing that. And that gives us credibility, being transparent, including people in the process, builds up our credibility. And of course, people want to be liked. Of course, organizations want to be liked, but that's not the point of credibility in an emergency. We want to be honest. We want to be truthful. We want to be forthcoming with information so that people will trust our organization enough to come to us for answers. We want to do so with empathy. We want to be able to express empathy. And by that, we, we need to use words to express empathy, saying, this is a scary situation instead of, I'm sorry for what you're going through, resonates more. Being able to identify what people are going through, being able to demonstrate that you're paying attention to what they're going through has more impact. And if people can relate, they're more likely to take your recommendations, which leads us to the, the fifth principle of CERC, and I would argue the most important principle of CERC. The whole point of crisis and emergency, emergency risk communication is to promote action. There will never be enough emergency responders to one-on-one -on -one help every single person in an emergency who needs help. We need to be able to clearly communicate what people can do to protect themselves. So if we can be first with right information and we've built up their our credibility so people trust what we're saying, then hopefully they will, they will take our recommendations, they will trust our suggestions, and they will take action based on those. And our last principle, although I, I, I don't love that it has to be written, is show respect, but it's understandable that it does. In an emergency, people are understandably focused on themselves. They are focused on their losses. They are focused on their situation. They are focused on their families. Um, responders themselves can often get focused on the task at hand and forget that they're dealing with people. So show respect is a principle of CERC as a reminder to step back every now and then and remember that it's people working with people. The six principles of CERC are here as a guideline. They're not meant to be memorized. You're not supposed to repeat them um, and have to do them by rote memory every time you go into an emergency. They're meant as a guide to help you in your journey through communicating during an emergency. Every emergency goes through a rhythm. Preparation is what you're doing now, taking a class, learning what you can to make your next emergency better. You can draft messages. You can test them out and see how they might be received in your target population. Developing partnerships is something that's key in preparation. Um, making sure that you know who you would work with, the types of organizations you would work with, the types of audiences you would communicate to, what languages they speak, what, what um, psychological barriers they may, they may pose, what um, religions you may be able to distribute information through, um, what churches and what community groups you may be able to work with. This is when you can do a whole lot to be ready for an emergency to happen. Because when in the initial phase happens, you see there, express empathy, promote action. This is where the CERC principles start to take place. However, if you haven't done anything to prepare, it'll be a bit difficult to hit the ground running. The maintenance phase happens whether a response is two years, two weeks, two months. 
um, it's, it's an opportunity to get more information. You're going to have more background. You're going to find out more about the emergency, why it, why it started, what caused it, and you'll be able to provide that information. You will also start to see rumors developing, and you'll be able to address those or determine whether you have the bandwidth to address all of them. You can also start to really target your audiences, making sure that everyone has the information that they need. The resolution phase is when you can really focus kind of on developing an, an educational plan. It's, it's when your emergency itself is coming to an end, but you can look back and, and determine what went well and, and what didn't go well and maybe how, how people can prepare to do differently or, or the same if they did really well um, as they did the, the next time. So if they have an emergency kit, maybe this is a good time to remind them to restock it. If they didn't have an emergency kit, maybe this is a good time to educate them on how to build one because that, because that previous emergency is so fresh in their mind. The CERC rhythm used to be five phases and now it's four. Evaluation used to be the fifth phase, but now it's at the top because it's something that you should do all the time. You should do evaluation throughout an emergency because it's something that should be incorporated throughout. If any part of your, communi of your communication effort isn't working, you should readjust. You should evaluate and change what you're doing because if it's not working, if it's not helpful, then there's no point in continuing to do it. So now we're going to talk about how to use some different tools, media, social media, and mobile media to disseminate those communication messages once you've developed them. Again, we already did some webinars on how to develop messages and messages and audiences and how to disseminate messages through community engagement. This webinar talks about how to use these different tools. Media is one tool. You don't have to use all of these tools. You can use one, some, a combination, or again, none. These are options, but media are usually a tool that you'll want to consider in an emergency if power and, and resources are available for them to, to be an option. The media need to be there because they are able to reach the largest number of people at once. So this is the quickest way to disseminate information to a, a large segment of the population with important public health protective actions. They also know how to reach their audiences and they know what their audiences need. They, they have already done their demographic research for, for their own channels outside of emergencies. They know what their audiences need. They know how to target them where they're at. So providing our protective messages to different media channels is helpful because they know how to disseminate those messages effectively. Social media can be extremely helpful in a crisis in the same way. As you can see under several of these, they can be first, be right, be credible, express empathy, and promote action. Social media can help us incorporate our CERC principles. But what social media also allows is for our audiences to be participants. They're, they allow a discourse. They allow the, the communities affected by an emergency to interact with us, not just be spectators in the emergency communication process. So while we are sharing information with the public, sharing facts that they need and empowering decision-making, they can share facts back with us about what they need and where our messages are working and where our messages aren't working. They can also monitor how we're doing. They can let us know whether or not we're doing a, a good job, um, monitoring how our, our emergency response is being handled. Social media is extremely helpful in incorporating the CERC principles and in increasing transparency and providing information to the public. But while it can inform, it can also misinform. As quickly as it can misinform, we can correct information, but it is something we need to be cautious and aware of. We need to be 
able to monitor the channels that we choose to use. So being aware of the staff that you have available to run these channels, to post to these channels, and to monitor these channels. CDC typically only monitors or manages Facebook and Twitter accounts because it's time consuming. If your organization can only manage one channel, if that's what's realistic, you need to make that consideration. If it's something that you can't do, if it's not realistic to have a social media channel, that's something you need to consider. Again, these are all options, but if you're going to use channels, you need to be realistic about how you'll maintain them. Um, and be aware also that social media is, is actually now a resource that media uses to get information for their headlines. Um, if you've watched any of the major 24-hour news services in recent years, you will notice they sometimes have um, social media feeds as part of their news coverage. They will show pop-up Twitter feed boxes, or they will have a ticker running along the bottom of the screen with Facebook comments. Social media is becoming a news source because it's hard to fill a 24-hour news stream. So again, if you're going to use social media in an emergency, it's something that you really need to be able to manage and it's something you have to consider staffing um, and, and time um, restraints. When you do start to notice rumors, um, start to notice errors, if it's an error that your organization makes, it's important that you address it. It's important that you quickly address it, proactively address it, and, and make any corrections that are necessary. If it's a rumor started by, by another organization, you may not always be able to address it, depending on how many rumors are out there. It's not realistic for you and your organization responding to an emergency with all of the demands on your organization to be responding to every rumor that pops up. The test really is if the rumor is encouraging negative behavior, and if it seems to be gaining traction, if it seems to be something that the public is believing to be true, then you'll want to address it. Now, you don't want to address it by repeating the rumor, because people tend to believe the first message they hear. You'll want to address the rumor by repeating your messages, by repeating your good public health messages. But that's how we tend to determine when to address a rumor. Because again, in an emergency, you have very little time. You're, you're under extremely constricted time restraints. So to address every rumor isn't realistic. What you'll need to do is determine which ones are important. And the ones that are most important are the ones that are dangerous, are encouraging dangerous behaviors that people might act on. Measuring social media is really important for a couple of reasons. Um, largely, though, it helps us determine if we're, if we're having an impact, if our communications are helping. Some of the social media channels that you can choose have their own measurement systems um, built into them, so they can tell you whether, whether your messages are being shared, whether they're being liked, whether they're being um, you know, retweeted. And if, if that's the case, and you, you can kind of intuit that, that they're spreading and that people are moving them along. You might be saying the right thing. And at, at the very least, they are being spread. They're, they're reaching further and further audiences. Um, some of the measurement tools that we are able to use are um, communication surveillance and and these can also give us some indication of the messages that are causing confusion. Are we driving the right conversation? Again, these, these measurements are also time consuming. So we have to factor in the amount of time that it takes us to measure and report on what we're gathering from our measurements. 
but it's important that we do so because it can tell us whether we're on target. This is part of that evaluation process I was talking about in the rhythm. If we can evaluate whether our messages are reaching the people that we want to reach, whether they're driving the conversation in the right direction, then we know we're on target. If we can evaluate that our conversations aren't being driven in the right direction, that we're leaving gaps in the conversation, if we can, if we can assess the types of questions that we're leaving unanswered, then we can change what we're doing and make it better. Also available to us as a tool is mobile media. Most people have a cell phone, some kind of mobile media available to them. And as long as the, the right circuits are up and the power is up and running, mobile media can be a really valuable resource in an emergency. Um, information sharing and alerts, so text messaging type alerts can be extremely valuable for letting people know if something is coming, maybe in a natural disaster, maybe in a weather event. Um, Real-time coverage of events is extremely helpful for providing information to communities, but also for communities to provide information to us. If communities can call a hotline to explain this picture on this particular slide, that little earthworm looking thing is Ebola. And that number, 115, is the hotline number that was given in Guinea during the West Africa Ebola outbreak. The hotline number in each of those West African countries allowed people to call in with questions, with um, requests for information, but they were also able to, to tell the hotline operators what was going on in their neighborhoods. So sharing information, which enables hotline operators, which enables responders and communicators to adjust the response and to adjust messages accordingly. So again, this is an interactive tool that can be extremely useful. Also geographically targeted. So we know exactly how to reach people where they're at. Now, Mobile media challenges are the same as other challenges of media and social media. If there is infrastructure damage, so if power isn't working, if cell towers aren't working, um, it can be a challenge to use any of these as tools and resources. So you go back to community engagement, which was a previous webinar that we, that we talked about, in-person, face-to-face discussions. Some people have limited access. We can't take for granted that everyone has access to cell phones, to social media, to these resources, and it may not be because they can't access it, although some people can't afford, they may not want access. Some people choose not to, not to partake in these types of technologies. So we need to consider layered approaches at disseminating messages. Information overload. If the systems are overloaded, it may be difficult to actually send messages through these channels. And we've already talked about how these channels are an investment of time. Your staff needs to be able to use them, and they also need to have the time to use them. They need to have the time to keep up with the comments. They need to have the time to respond to them. So, there's a challenge to using these channels, just like there's a challenge to all channels, which is why we recommend when you're disseminating messages in an emergency that you try to structure a layered approach. Because while these channels will reach some of your audiences, community engagement will reach other audiences. So making sure that you're, you're targeting your emergency response as best you can to reach as many people as possible is usually advisable. This is one of our shorter uh, lessons, and I'm actually done with my teaching portion of it, but I would love to answer any questions you may have if you want to type them into the chat box or, um, or, or put some notes in the comments section. I can answer any of your questions.
Thank you for that presentation, Kelly. We will now transition to our Q&A session. And our first question asks, regarding social media, for those of us who would like to start a social media presence, is there a good way to quickly build our followers before an incident? It's not necessarily a quick thing. Um, you really want to make sure that you're trying to build that followership in advance of an emergency. So the way that CDC actually does it, we have an emergency Facebook page. So we share preparation information. Um, we try to engage with our audiences through um, preparation activities and preparation awareness so that they know where to find us in an emergency when something actually happens, when that initial phase actually happens, they'll know to come to us for emergency messages then. Great, thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, one more question here. Could you better distinguish between emergency responders versus community engagement? Between emergency responders and community engagement? I think they might possibly mean like community responders, maybe people who aren't officially emergency response. Okay, so, well, emergency responders would be people who are, have a role in the emergency. So um, emergency responders could be people who have an operational role, a logistical role. They could be first responders. They could be police, fire, um, paramedic. They could be um, communicators. So we are actually emergency responders as well. We deploy to scenes to determine what kind of information people need and, and disseminate that as quickly as we can. Um, and community um, responders, if that's what we're asking, um, community engagement would be people in the community with a role in the community where we can work closely with them. So local pastors or leaders of community groups who can help us disseminate information, who we can work closely with in that community, who know the community um, and can help us tailor messages um, and target audiences. So people who um, are Spanish speaking and can help us communicate and relay information or people who are um, uh, pastors of, of, of a large congregation and are willing to share our information to to their um, to their congregation things like that people who are leaders in their community who are willing to share our messages if I'm understanding your question um, if I'm not please do type in a, a correction great and we have a question here from Maria she would like to know do you have any communication recommendations during a power outage when public cannot view media channels and mobile access could possibly be limited. So the way that we have been working um, in previous responses lately, so during Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, um, it was extremely challenging to, to work with power outages that lasted in, uh, months. We worked closely with the health department to print flyers and try to make sure that flyers were disseminated throughout different neighborhoods. We posted them at places we knew people would have to go, so gas stations and grocery stores um, and hardware stores. Um, tried to make sure that we were putting that information where we knew people would have to eventually be. Um, also worked with the U.S. Postal Service to make sure that they um, to, to get their assistance in delivering those messages to people's homes. Um, so getting a little bit creative about disseminating messages that way um, via hard copy flyers, um, but also through community engagement, getting community groups to talk to each other and being able to make those, those connections and, and, and having those conversations. Great answer, thanks Kelly. Uh, we have another question here from Michael. He wants to know, how about conflicts between either different departments within the same level of government or different levels? For example, federal versus state, et cetera. Um, um, 
So I'm just going to read his uh, post for a bit. For example, let's take the Flint water supply lead disaster. Um, state and municipal entities were sending one message, the water is safe, and then other health professionals were sending the exact opposite, that the water was not safe. If there is no JIC to the conflict, do you recommend pressing forward with your own messages, even if they conflict with other um, entities? That is an interesting question, and I actually was able to spend a little bit of time in Flint, Michigan um, myself. There was a JIC, uh, eventually, a Joint Information Center, for those of you who don't know what that stands for, and we were able to coordinate with um, county-level government um, representatives and other federal level government to coordinate messages um, to make sure that people were getting clear and consistent messages. But it did take some time, as uh, many of you are aware, it took a while from the point where the public was aware there was a problem to there being a coordinated communication effort. Um, that's a unique case, and what I would do is keep trying to make those connections, keep trying to build those relationships, and keep trying to elevate it until there can be a coordinated response. That's what needs to be happening. Um, so keep um, plugging away at building those relationships to get a, a consensus on what the message should be, because the, the more disconnected the message is, the more confused the public is going to be. And let's remember that the point of CERC in the end is really to help people make the best decisions they can to protect their health. This is, this is protecting people's lives. So um, it doesn't matter who the message is coming from, but when you're coming to terms on what the message should be, it really should be coordinated um, effort. Great. Thank you for that. This individual would like to know, regarding social media, are there any specific platforms um, that you have noticed have more traffic or reach a higher audience? Do you know of any specific ones? Um, I will probably say something and then tomorrow it'll be irrelevant and out of date. <laughs> Um, which is why our, our most recent revisions to the CERC manual actually don't include specific channels anymore. Um, our, our last revision still had uh, references to MySpace in it. So um, the quick answer is no, but really Facebook and Twitter seem to have continued traction, continued large followerships. So, pardon me. So we are... Um, still using those um, outlets and most of the state and local health departments that I interact with, that I do these trainings for, that, um, that we partner with, are also using those channels. So it seems to be something that um, has a large audience ship, audience membership, I'm making up words today, but um, that, that has more uh, traction. Great, Kelly. We have a question here that was asked previously, but there is a twist. This individual would like to know, um, what recommendations can you give to combat rumors uh, when these agencies' social media accounts are down due to a power, power failure, but they want to know specifically what the PIO um, would do because uh, they're, they assume that this individual is in charge of mitigating the rumors. So, powers down. Uh, what is the recommendation that you can give to the reason about? So the power is down. How would you reach the public? Yes. Uh, what recommendations can you give to combat the rumors? For the PIO, when the power is down. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I want to make sure I get all the elements of that question. Um, Kind of the same as before, you're really going to have to use channels that are more hard copy, word of mouth, um, in-person uh, interactions. So um, town hall meetings are a great way to invite people to come get information directly from the horse's mouth. So having people um, uh, invited to a certain location. This is gonna depend on the community that you're in and the resources that you have. So um, when, you know, again, to use the example of Puerto Rico, 
island-wide the power was out so everybody coming to one location not really um, realistic but having maybe several different locations for a town hall meeting um, like I said we did uh, mass distribution of flyers um, with with our official logos uh, for the for the Department of Health and for CDC on there so that they would have um, they, so they would know these are the official documents this is the official information it's not um, it's not coming from somewhere uh, that's not verifiable. Um, so it's it's thinking outside of the box and back to the back to when we didn't have cell phones, back to when we didn't have our computers and our TVs. Um, interestingly, radio is is something that we never consider um, in normal. In, in, in non-emergency situations, we always go straight for um, TV news. We always go straight for uh, internet and, and mobile um, apps type information. But radio, battery-powered radios are a really great resource for sharing information. Thanks, Kelly. And we have... A great question here. How should we deal with trolls on social media? They can be very vocal in their attempts to gain followers. And is it worth combating the rumors that they spread? Again, only if they are encouraging negative behaviors and their and their behaviors, the recommendations seem to be gaining traction. So if people seem to be acting on their advice. Um, the combination of those two things, I would say, warrant a response. Um, but interestingly, we haven't had to do a, a lot of that. Some of, some of the trolling that CDC even has, has experienced um, hasn't been necessary for us to respond directly as much as other people start to comment on those trolls um, themselves. So we will have another audience member, another, another commenter respond to those comments. So it becomes, it becomes a great discussion forum for, um, for followers to get into conversation without us ever needing to engage. Um, so keep an eye on and pay attention to, and if they are sharing dangerous public health recommendations that seem to be gaining support, then yes you would want to start crafting a response. But not every, again, not every rumor, not every troll warrants a reply. Thanks so much, Kelly. This individual would like to know how do you handle when users ask specific questions on social media pages? Um, do you need to respond? Is it best not to respond? Um, what is your take on that? I mean, if they're asking a specific question that you can answer, then do. If you have the time, if, you're, if they're asking a specific question about the response, about where to get more information, and you have that available, then then do respond. Um, largely what you may wanna do in your original post is provide information about where more information can be found. Provide links to other channels where more information can be found. Um, so your response could just be a reiteration of that. Um, but if people are asking specific questions, when you have the time to answer them, you should answer them. Thanks so much, Kelly. In a world that is technology-based, do you still see a role for AM, FM radio and paper message dissemination? Absolutely, definitely. Um, we, are, we are dealing with this in several different types of communities. We're dealing with this in communities that just prefer these channels. These are the, the preferred formats for communication. Um, and then when power is, is down, when these resources are not available and, the, and these, these modern technologies 
um, fail on us. These are the resources that we really need to come back to. So absolutely, these are, these are tools that we never want to stop using. Like I said, it's part of a layered communication approach when you're in an emergency. Thanks, Kelly. This individual would like to know, does the role of the community health worker aid within the community? Uh, let me rephrase that. Can the role of the community health worker aid in the role of being a first responder and getting information out to the community since they are in many areas and are trusted by some? Do you suggest training them ahead of time or adding them to the chain of messaging? Yeah, community health workers can be extremely helpful. Um, and these are the types of partnerships I was talking about in the preparation phase that, um, that are worth building up. So um, when, when uh, an organization, when a response organization is considering how to disseminate messages, um, working with local community health workers to determine who they work with and the communities that they have access to and having an agreement for how they would go out and help disseminate those, those messages would be a great situation to have identified ahead of time so that they can quickly identify what messages, what format, and, and, and how and when to disseminate what resources. Um, yeah, these would be ideal relationships to have built up in advance. Absolutely. Um, we, did, we did a previous webinar on the spokesperson, and the spokesperson can be, like I said, it can be a religious leader, but it can also be a trusted resource like a community health worker, somebody that is recognized in the community as a trusted resource for information, who clearly has the community's best interests at heart. Great. Thanks so much, Kelly. Another question here would like to know, I, I guess it kind of ties in with what was asked previously. Do you feel that community mailings, maybe say monthly mailings, newsletters are important to send out in rural areas where let's say they don't use social media as often as some? We actually do um, a newsletter ourselves, our Emergency Partners Information Connection, and we are um, we do this so that we can keep a connection with our emergency partners and so that they know how to reach us, um, so they know what we have available um, as far as things like this, as far as trainings go, but also so that they know in an emergency where they can come for more information so that we can build those relationships and keep those connections open so they we can keep those lines of um, information open so sure yeah if it's something that you have the resources and the time uh, and availability to do to be able to 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 create and and maintain we do ours quarterly so maybe that's something to think about if you can't do it monthly so it's it's definitely something to consider if you want to make sure that you guys are, are advertising your resources and building those relationships in your community to make yourselves available and 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 to advertise your your presence yeah thanks so much kelly Last question here, does CDC take the same approach to which communication channels that they use domestically and internationally? Yes and no. So um, like I said, radio actually is something I hadn't even considered until I deployed to West Africa. It was something that I thought of as, you know, um, once upon a time. And it was uh, a a regularly used resource, something that everyone had in their home or their village. So um, I'm, I'm learning to be open to the communities that I visit, the communities that I deploy to, and, and um, gauging what the community uses, what the community needs, and being aware of, of, um, of engaging with the people I'm speaking to and how, how they receive information. Um, 
internationally, some of the, um, some of the apps are a bit different. So um, WhatsApp in Africa was a bit more popular than say um, the, the Twitter accounts. Um, Facebook was kind of similar. Lots of people used Facebook, but there, there's, there are different channels. There are different channels. There are some similarities, there are some differences. So it's really being aware of your audience. It's really being aware of where you are and it's really being willing to listen to what people need and how people need to receive information instead of just assuming that you know instead of going somewhere and pushing it out via one or two channels that are convenient because it's what you usually do um, and, and doing a little bit of research, doing a little background to figure out what works best for people, meeting them where they are with the information that they need. Great, thank you so much for your answers, Kelly. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us for today's webinar. And if you have any additional questions, please email them to circrequest at cdc.gov. Now, as a reminder, today's presentation has been recorded and you can earn continuing education for your participation. Please follow the instructions linked in your invitation you received. The course access code, once again, is CERC1024 with all letters capitalized. Thank you for joining us throughout the CERC series. We hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Bye bye.